Well, good morning, church. Let's stand to our feet. We're going to praise Jesus this morning. Let's get our hands up. Come on. verse 8 says that we need to trust God at all times and that we need to pour out our hearts to him so can we do that this morning can we just pour out our hearts and lift him up with grace because he is worthy blessed assurance and Jesus is mine 
He's been my fourth man in the fire Time after time I'm born of His Spirit Washed in His blood And what He did for me on Calvary Is more than enough Trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. Cause I trust in God, my Savior.
says that God is love and love never fails. God is love and love never fails. So he cannot fail us. And to sing that and say that we trust in you, God, you will never fail is to invite the love of the Father into the room. To say, Lord, I invite your love to come and touch my heart. So God, we thank you for the love that you have for your kids, Lord. We thank you for the love that hung on a tree for you and for me, Lord. We thank you for the love that walked out of a grave. Would you come and touch us with your love this morning, Lord, that our hearts will sing, our God will never fail. Our God is full of love. We love you, Lord. Come on, let's sing this together. So no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after. Oh, your love, your love. So no wall you won't kick down, love was asked what inspired you to write this song he described holding his firstborn son Gabriel and this is how he answered the question he said I remember thinking about Gabriel he's an infant he can't do anything there's nothing this little boy could ever make me do to love him any less and it was through that experience that I began to see the father rightly that's the way he looks at me I don't have to earn his love. I don't have to do something to deserve his affection in his heart. He just simply adores me because I'm his son and I'm made in his image. And that changed everything for me. I love the way that John describes that kind of love very specifically in 1 John 4 when he wrote this. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Let's pray as we get ready for communion. Father God in heaven, we are astounded by your love. It just takes our breath away. It, it, it's why we sing, it's why we gather, it's why we remember the great sacrifice of your son every week. So God, as we reflect on the, on the bread and the juice that represent his body and blood, we just let the reality of your love just soak in our hearts by your spirit, God. We pray in the name of Jesus, amen. You may be seated and you can take the bread and the juice as we reflect in this moment.
As we move into a time of giving, I want to give you an update on our support for hurricane relief. We partnered with the International Disaster Emergency Services, a group called IDES. They're based here in Indianapolis, and they responded rather quickly to uh, have a place in East Tennessee and a couple places in Florida in order to get relief to those families in need. Needed supplies of water, toiletries, food, and they got there very quickly. There was so much response that the they didn't have any more volunteer needs for East Tennessee, but if you wanted to volunteer, they still have some needs in Florida. Most of you know that it wasn't just Hurricane Helene. Right on the heels of that, Milton came through. So there are two uh, stations in Florida at Ormond Beach and also St. Petersburg that I just currently located. And I want you to know that just in the first two weeks, our church has collected almost $20,000 already in hurricane relief. We got two more weeks, church. Uh, we can give a little bit more and help out more people. Let's go ahead and pray for those victims and give God thanks. Father God, uh, we're just heavy hearted and burdened when a disaster comes through. And many of us know people that were directly affected, some even our very own family members. And it is heartbreaking to see the devastating loss. So we pray, God, that the response of the church would be felt. The response of those who are caring for them would just be a tangible way that they would feel your love and your comfort. God, would you use our gifts, just multiply it, that it might inspire others to get involved in the relief efforts, God. And we, we just pray you bring true relief and recovery as they rebuild, not just for their physical needs, God, but for their emotional, spiritual, and relational needs as well because people are grieving, God, and that's gonna be a long recovery. So we pray that they would have a strong sense of your presence in the midst of this suffering. We ask this in the name of Jesus, amen. Let's celebrate the opportunity to give. Take a look at the screens and here's a few updates. Thank you so much for joining us in worship today. My name is Zach and I wanna welcome you to Mount Pleasant. If you're new here, we would like to give you a special welcome. We wanna meet you and answer any questions you might have. You might be asking yourself, how can I do that? Well, here's what you can do. Grab the sermon notes you got when you walked in, flip that over to the backside and scan the QR code. Once you do that, you can fill out a connection card, submit a prayer request, give online, sign up for an event, and you can even access the sermon notes for this week on the YouVersion app. If you're with us in person and want to meet and talk to someone face to face, you can also take a next step by visiting us at Guest Connections after the service. Once you walk out of the worship center after the service, it will be on the right of the main lobby area. We've got some great leaders there ready and waiting to meet you and give you more information about Mount Pleasant and how you can get more connected. Are you interested in serving on a short-term mission trip? Well, we have an opportunity to partner with one of our global mission partners, TCM International, in May of 2025. This spring, our team will serve at House Edelweiss during graduation week. House Edelweiss is TCM's graduate level training school for Eastern European pastors. Our team will take care of meal preparation, meal serving, groundskeeping, housekeeping, and maintenance while the students and professors are in class and preparing for their graduation ceremony. For more for more details, please plan to attend an information meeting coming up on Sunday, October 27th at 9 a.m. Men, please do not forget about our men's breakfast happening on Saturday, October 26th. Fathers, bring your sons as men of all ages are welcome to attend. Now, let's get out our Bibles and focus on our message from Pastor Matt Pineda as he continues in our series, Encounter. July 20th on 1969, who remembers what happened? A few hands kind of go up. This was the landing of Apollo 11 on the moon. Now who remembers it? Okay, I wasn't alive. I don't remember <laughs> when that happened. 
But uh, I know what happened, right? Because it was a significant moment. It was the first time that a human being, as far as we know, uh, walked on the moon, right? And so Apollo 11 mission uh, was so significant. We remember when Neil Armstrong landed on the moon, he said, that's one small step for man and one giant leap for mankind, right? See, you guys know it as well because this is important. In fact, I would argue that um, in our relative lifetime, like the things that have happened relatively close to when we have lived, this is probably the most significant thing to have happened. I mean, this is the most significant moment. And we know this moment because it's important. But did you know that there are actually conspiracy theories about whether this happened or not? Right? I'm not going to ask if that's you or not. I don't want to offend you. But uh, there are people who question uh, whether we actually landed on the moon. This isn't just unique to um, Apollo 11. This is, uh, this is to all the Apollo missions, but also, I don't know if you're paying attention or not, but this is pretty common for any major event that happens in our world today. There are conspiracy theories. Did you know? Did you know that there are people who think that our government is directing hurricanes to the state of Florida, right? I, I, listen, just because we hear it doesn't mean that everybody believes it. There are conspiracy theories on both sides, and this is the world that we live in today. Some people couldn't care less about these major things that happen. Other people, their whole world is wrapped up in everything that happens. Today, we are going to encounter a major event, and how you respond to it matters more than anything else in your life. Your response to Jesus and the truth of his deity is the most important thing for us to respond to. If you're watching online, I want to welcome you and glad that you are here with us. The next couple chapters of the Gospel of John, Jesus has some encounters with people and their responses to him vary. We're going to do a fly-by look at uh, John's chapter 18, 19, and 20. And so if you have your Bible or if you want to take out your phone, I mean, we're going to be all over those three chapters and I'd love for you to be able to follow along with me. Um, and so we're going to focus on some people that maybe in these uh, moments, we don't always focus on it. This is the story of Jesus's, his death and his resurrection. And we know that story, but there are other peoples in the midst of this storyline that we, uh, we, we don't talk about all the time. This series is all about the encounters that we have with Jesus or that people have with Jesus, how it changes everything and how it should change us. But here's what I recognize. Sadly, not everyone encounters Jesus the same way. Not everyone has the same outcome. All of these moments, they teach us something. They, they all mean something. And here's what I want to encourage you to do. You may be able to find yourself in the midst of these stories. And I would encourage you to do that. I would encourage you to um, envision yourself in these moments, in these scenes that we talk about. What would your response be? Um, how would you respond to Jesus? What would you have done or said? I want you to, to put yourself there because, again, how we respond to Jesus it matters. There's a lot of things in this world where our response doesn't matter. There's a lot of things where our response is, uh, you know, uh, it's out of preference or it's not of importance. But again, when it comes to Jesus, our response, it matters. Now, what we're going to do in these chapters is we're going to look at a story. This is a storyline. This is not a, a teaching of Jesus. It's not a parable of Jesus. This is a narrative, okay? And so we're gonna walk through different pieces of this story. And so I'm gonna just ask you to be gracious with me as we pull out some of these responses to Jesus. So let's get started. Let's take a look at some of the responses that we find to Jesus to catch you up to speed. If you haven't been here the last few weeks, Jesus has had his final meal. He has uh, went down into the olive grove, in, into the garden of Gethsemane. He has prayed with and for his disciples. He has taught them one final moment and then here in this moment, everything is going to change for Jesus because he's about to be arrested and uh, the last few hours of his life. And so with all of that, our very first response that we see to Jesus is that of resistance, resistance. And you will see this um, in the attitude and the actions of the soldiers. Let me show you how. Look at these words from John chapter 18. It says, the leading priests and the Pharisees had given Judas a contingent of Roman soldiers and temple guards to accompany him. Now with blazing torches, lanterns, and weapons, they arrived at the olive grove. Jesus fully realized all that was going to happen to him, and so he stepped forward to meet them. Who are you looking for? He asked. Jesus the Nazarene, they replied. 
I am he, Jesus said. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with him. And as Jesus said, I am he, they all drew back and fell to the ground. What a fascinating scene, right? I've always been amazed at this scene because it's, I think, one of the most um, profound moments displaying the power of Jesus that we see in the Gospels. The the first thing that I think we we notice from this uh, text is that John really points out that Jesus was in full control of everything that was going to happen. I mean, nothing here surprised Jesus. There was nothing that was going to happen to Jesus that caught him off guard. He knew what was going to happen. In fact, that's what he says. He says, Jesus fully realized all that was going to happen to him. It's John's way of showing us that Jesus is the one with the power. He's the one in control. And so I want you to think about who shows up, right? You have Judas, who we know that Judas was the one that betrayed Jesus. He was one of his disciples. And then you have the temple guards and a contingent of Roman soldiers. Now, if you picture yourself in this scene, I don't know what pops up into your mind, but for the longest time, as when I read this text and, and, and tried to picture this scene, I just kind of thought like Jesus was in this nice garden with a bunch of flowers and a, a small group of people comes to arrest him. But I don't know why I thought that it could be uh, more inaccurate because a contingent of Roman soldiers is an interesting detail. There's debate on what this actually means because it could mean a lot of different things. But one thing that we do know that it means is that it wasn't a small group. It wasn't a small number. The Greek word for contingent is spira, and that really refers to a military cohort, which was somewhere between 300 and 600 soldiers, okay? And so when you think about that, the smallest estimate of Roman soldiers is 300. If you go uh, study a little bit more, you find that the largest estimate was up to 1,000 soldiers. That's a lot of soldiers, right? It's a lot of people to come arrest somebody who never hurt anybody, okay? And yet this is the scene that we find themselves in. What were they carrying? Blazing torches, lanterns, and weapons. Judas, who had betrayed him and was leading these people to Jesus because he knew where he was. If you think about this, Judas had actually traded his relationship with Jesus, the eternal light, for a man-made torch. And yet, all these men with him, although that they're armed, they were not prepared for what would happen next because Jesus... In full control, John records, he speaks, and then what? They all, fought, they all drew back and fell to the ground. Just picture it, right? Like, can you picture that? Like 300 Roman soldiers uh, drawing back and falling to the ground when Jesus speaks. It's a display of power. What these men experienced in this moment was supernatural. His words alone dropped them to the ground. I want you to think about this. What do you think? the soldiers, uh, what was going through their minds, right? I mean, they had given these older orders to, to find this man in this garden. They didn't know what he looked like. It was Judas who was leading him to him and, and to arrest him, right? And that was their orders. And yet in this moment, they just experience the power of Jesus. Do you think any one of them thought, man, who is this guy? Like, why are we arresting him? He, he's, he's clearly something special or he, maybe he is from God. I don't know what was going through their minds but I imagine somebody must have thought something. Now, in the midst of this incredible scene, Peter um, actually does something really inappropriate. If you remember the story in verse 10, it says this, and Peter, he drew a sword and he slashed off the right ear of Malchus, the high priest slave. Like Peter, like, what are you doing, right? Like that was, that's not how Jesus led. He had never told anybody to do anything like that. And yet that's what Peter thought he should do in that moment, um, pull out a sword and cut someone's ear off, right? But this moment, actually wasn't about what Peter did. It's about what Jesus did. Uh, John actually leaves out this detail, but Luke reminds us of what happens next. Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and he healed him. What a scene. What, what What a moment. I want you to think about this though. What did the soldiers do? Right? They, they've, they've, ex- experienced Jesus' power. They, they've, they've seen him uh, speak words and they drop to the ground. They, they've seen him with their own eyes right in front of them in this moment. This wasn't a story that they, hold, that, that they were told. They, they saw Jesus heal a man's ear right in front of them. They've experienced all of this. What did they do? Well, we know what they did next in verse 12. It says, so the soldiers, their commanding officer and the temple guards arrested Jesus and tied him up. Now, it seems to me that they were resistant 
to the truth about Jesus? What else did they need in that moment? They, they've experienced his power, they've seen his power, and yet they just carried on their task. I think that they hardened their hearts in this moment and were resistant to Jesus. And here's what I think. I imagine that you know people in your life who are resistant to Jesus as well, right? Maybe that's someone in here today. Maybe you've, uh, you've had some encounters with God yourself, but you've been resistant to responding to him. You've been resistant to the life change that Jesus can bring into your life. And it could be for any number of reasons. I'm not really sure, but I want to encourage you today, just in this moment, before we move on, to open your mind and to open your heart about Jesus. Now, don't be resistant to him and, and, and what you could believe about him to be true, because here in this moment, these soldiers, the soldiers, no matter what they saw or what they, they heard, they were, they were hard-hearted, and they closed themselves, and they were resistant to Jesus. I don't want that to be true for any of us. I want us to be open-hearted and receptive to Jesus. But for all of us today, when we encounter Jesus, listen, when we encounter Jesus, we are forced to recognize his power and his authority, just as the soldiers did. The question is, is when we encounter Jesus like this, are we falling before him in surrender, right? Or are we resisting his authority in our lives? That's the question for all of us. This is how resistant are we to Jesus? And maybe that's the question I would uh, ask you to think about is how might you be resistant to the authority of Jesus in your life? Because this isn't just about the soldiers. This can be about us as well. Could you think about the answer to that question for a moment? Maybe write down one word that would help you respond to that. <clears throat> because it could change your life moving forward if you were able to remove the ways that you were resistant to Jesus' authority in your life. And so the first response that we see in this story from the soldiers is resistance, that of resistance. After Jesus was arrested, they take him to Annas, and they take him to Caiaphas, the high priest, and they question him there. And then they send him on to Pilate. Now, Pilate was the Roman governor of Judea. And so he had a lot of control and a lot of responsibility to make sure there was uh, peace uh, throughout Jerusalem. And so um, they take him to Pilate. And Jesus shows up at Pilate's doorstep in, into his quarters that next morning. And Pilate, this was a nuisance to him. He did not want to deal with Jesus and whatever this problem was. Yet he... Uh, invited Jesus into his quarters. He converses with him and he questions him in this moment. And in the midst of all of that, he actually determines that Jesus hasn't done anything wrong. That he hasn't done anything worth punishing. And so we read this in verse 38. It says, so he went out again to the people and he told them he's not guilty of any crime, right? And so we see that. And in that moment, so fascinating if you know the story. In this moment, the people who are there actually tell Pilate that they would rather have a prisoner released from prison than see Jesus walk free. Do you remember this? They would rather have a prisoner released than see Jesus walk free. And so with all of that, this is actually where we see, I think, the second response to Jesus, this time from Pilate, and that is of indifference, right? Pilate had a little bit of indifference. Look what happens next in chapter 19. It says, then Pilate had Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip. The soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put a purple robe on him. Hail, King of the Jews! They mocked as they slapped him across the face. And Pilate went outside again and said to the people, I'm going to bring him out to you now, but understand clearly that I find him not guilty. And then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said, look, here is the man. And when they saw him, the leading priests and the temple guards began shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Take him yourselves and crucify him, Pilate said. I find him not guilty. Now, it's a strange scene, right? Because in this moment, Pilate's research about Jesus was right, but his response to Jesus was wrong because his response was that of indifference. Although he didn't believe that Jesus was guilty or deserving punishment or anything like that, he still had him flogged, which was a brutal, brutally painful experience that would rip the flesh off of your back. And then he still handed him over for 
crucifixion. In fact, Matthew's gospel tells us that uh, Pilate in this moment, he brought out a bowl of water and he washed his hands in front of the people, basically declaring to them, I'm not responsible for what happens next. All of that to say, Pilate didn't care that much, right? I mean, he he really didn't care that much. Even after this scene, Pilate brings Jesus back into his quarters and he's actually getting a little nervous, like, who who are you? And he asks him some pointed questions um, and he wants to free Jesus, but he can't. The people won't let him, They, they refuse that. And so Pilate succumbs and he orders his crucifixion. Pilate, although spending time with Jesus and not really convinced that he was a fraud and wondering actually who is this guy, he didn't care to explore anymore. He was indifferent. And here's the sad truth is that many of us, like Pilate, we encounter Jesus, but we remain undecided. Maybe that's somebody here today that you've remained undecided about Jesus, indifferent. I would beg you, to consider moving closer to a decision because Pilate had a choice. We have a choice. You have a choice. Don't be indifferent. Don't be undecided. There's actually way too much at stake in our response to Jesus to be indifferent. And here's, I I need you to listen to me as this as well. I'm not just talking about responding to Jesus as our savior. Some of us have remained indifferent about responding to him as our Lord. You hear me with that? We remain different on, indifferent on submitting our lives in every area and following after what he has for us. None of us, myself included, can be the type of people that don't make a choice about Jesus. It's simply too important. You know, one of the things that works against us is that we live, um, we live in a culture that has high exposure to Christianity, right? People know about Jesus. They've, they've heard about Jesus Um, But many people remain indifferent, right? They don't feel a pressure to make a decision about Christ or to submit to him because what's it matter, right? I've seen my own family and my own friends drift away from their faith because ultimately it eventually uh, just becomes indifference, right? Like, don't let this be true of you. And so the question, again, I'm gonna ask you a couple questions today. The question I'd ask you is, are you indifferent to Jesus? Like, Do you know information about him? I imagine there's some people in here today that's true of it. Do you know information, but you remain unhindered about following him? Such a dangerous way to live, to to know some of the truth. Jesus presents us with truth about himself. As he did Pilate, he presented the truth to Pilate, but it it demands a response from us. We have to respond to this. So What happens next is really important. What happens next is that Jesus makes his way to the cross. Pilate and the soldiers force Jesus to carry his cross up the hill. And Jesus, when he gets to the top of the hill, would be crucified on top of the cross and next to two criminals. This would be on top of the city for for everybody to see in this moment. And Jesus was killed. And it wasn't for any other reason that this was the plan and the purpose of God, that Jesus, who was a perfect person, who was the Lamb of God, would have to sacrifice himself and die on the cross to bring about forgiveness for all of mankind for all time. This was God's plan. This is the gospel. He knew that. But not everybody could see the whole picture. Then what happens next, because Jesus is killed, is he's wrapped up. They wrap his body up. And they put him in a tomb. And then they roll a stone in front of it. And everybody thought the story was over. I mean, listen, everybody thought the story was over. That's until the greatest event in the history of the world takes place. There was one person who decided to check up on all the events. Do anybody remember who that was? It's Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene was the very first person to show up to the tomb. And when she gets there, the stone has been rolled away. She walks into the tomb and she doesn't see Jesus' body. In fact, John tells us that Mary uh, saw two angels and these two angels begin talking to her saying, Mary, what are you doing here? There's nobody here. There's nobody to be found here. And in this moment, Mary walks out of that grave and we read this. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus. But she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? She thought he was the, she thought he was the gardener. 
Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him and I will go get him. Mary, said Jesus. And she turned to him and cried out, Rabboni, which is Hebrew for teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I haven't yet ascended to the Father. But go, find my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. And then she gave him them his message. What we see in this moment is actually the most appropriate response to Jesus, and that is life-changing excitement. That's what Mary Magdalene experienced as she encountered the resurrected Jesus and then shared it with the disciples. When she experienced Jesus in this way, everything had changed. Jesus was who he said he was, and he did what he said he was going to do. When Jesus conquered death and the grave, he once again proved what John is trying to show in this whole moment, that he was in control. His plan won't be thwarted. There's nothing that Satan can do. Even death himself could not stop Jesus from what he was going to do. Because Jesus had won, the disciples could win also. Mary got that. She understood that. And once she realized Jesus for who, she, for who he was, she was the very first one to share the gospel truth that Jesus has resurrected from the dead. That was a life-changing experience. She was excited. The question is, is does that excite you? Come on, you could talk to me a little bit. Does that excite you? That we still serve and worship a God that has done the impossible, that has done what no one has ever or will ever do again, that Jesus was killed and he walked out of the grave all by himself. That is the God that we serve and that we worship, and that should bring about some excitement in our life, I think. He not only did that, but listen, he predicted that he would do that. And so that should bring excitement as we worship. We, we should find ourselves wanting to raise our hands or, or at least at the very least smiling when we talk about Jesus with other people because he is the one true king. Our response to Jesus should be excitement. Now, about a month ago, I got to go on a, uh, mission trip with uh, some people here from our church. We went to Cuba um, to partner with our mission partners there in Cuba. And um, our partnership with there is really fascinating. We partner with um, the church in Old Havana, and they um, help run a leadership network that trains church leaders and ch uh, plants churches all throughout the city. It's a fascinating network. And during our time there, our team got to visit several different house churches all throughout the city, but we also got to train church leaders. In the midst of all of these visits, I met a man um, with a really fascinating story and testimony. And he was someone who was, um, in his, earlier in his life, was involved in witchcraft. In fact, he was known as someone in his community, in his neighborhood, as uh, the leader of witchcraft. And this was his story. But then, with sparing you some of the details, um, he experienced Jesus. He came into a relationship with Jesus, and his life changed. It, it changed dramatically, so much so that he... Uh, reverted from all the things he was doing and started begin studying to become a pastor. Now he is a pastor in a church in the neighborhood and is leading people out of rich, witchcraft, of which was his testimony. And as I talked to him and spoke to him about this, you could just see his eyes light up and his smile as he talked about Jesus and the life change that was brought into his life. And it just reminds me, this is the type of life-changing relationship that Jesus calls all of us to, to leave away the world and all that it has to offer and to follow and to pursue him. Now, listen, thankfully, many of us here don't have a dramatic story like that, right? M many of us don't have like the story of like, I was this and now I'm this, but all of us have a story. All of us, even if you've been raised in the church your entire life, we all have a story because when we encounter Jesus, he will change your life. None of us are exempt from Jesus changing our lives. Do you, we understand this, right? So here's the question, again, I wanna ask you, how has Jesus changed your life? Like, listen, we ought to be able to answer this question. You ought to be able to answer this question. I would argue that you should be able to answer this question before we start trying to lead people to Jesus. You, you need to know how Jesus has changed your life because when you encounter Jesus, he will change your life. If you haven't experienced that yet today, I invite you into that. You can experience that, and I want that for you. I wanna spend the rest of our time talking about 
the response that many people find themselves in. You know, maybe you wouldn't identify yourself as someone who is indifferent to Jesus or resistant to Jesus. Those seem kind of extreme. Um, Maybe you want this life-changing excitement, but you feel like you're just kind of lacking something. A lot of people find themselves with the fourth response that we see in this narrative is people just live with a little bit of doubt. Just have some doubt. And if that's you, guess what? You wouldn't be alone. In fact, research from the Barna Group suggests that 52% of teenagers and adults have experienced doubt relating to their faith recently. And of that group, 50%, so half of them say at some point in their life, they have experienced a prolonged period of doubt relating to their faith. Doubt is not uncommon. We need to remove that stigma a little bit. Doubt is not un- uncommon. And so if you're here today and you walked in with a little bit of doubt, like not, not sure about God or not sure about the Bible or not really sure about what to believe, I want you to know that you aren't alone. It's okay to have those doubts. In fact, I want you to know that you would probably fit in with the disciples a little bit. Remember, after Jesus' death, uh, the disciples, they went into hiding. They <laughs> started locking doors behind themselves, and, and they were afraid, and they were doubtful. But you look what happens after Mary had told all the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that they, they had also seen Jesus. This is what we read in chapter 20. It says, one of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, we have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound in his side. This, by the way, is how Thomas apparently went from being known as the twin to doubting Thomas. He wasn't sure. I mean, he still bought into Jesus a little bit, right? A little bit enough because he was still hanging around the disciples. He didn't fully check out, but he had his doubts. He had his questions and listen, Maybe you have your doubts. Maybe you aren't sure about creation or how dinosaurs fit into the story or you aren't sure how the Bible was put together or maybe you have your own thing or just a number of different things. Maybe you have your questions about these things but you still believe, right? Or maybe you have doubts and questions and concerns and actually they're big hangups for you and you can't overcome them. Maybe you're here today for no other reason out of obligation or your mom wants you to be here or whatever it is. I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that you are hanging around because you know what? Thomas hung around. Thomas didn't disappear. Even in his doubts, he didn't leave. Look what happens later in chapter 20. It says, eight days later, that's significant. Eight days later, the disciples were together again. And this time, Thomas was with them. The doors were locked. But suddenly, as before, (laughs) Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands and put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. And then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Thomas was what many of us, if we were honest, have been at some point, doubting, questioning, or curious. But he experienced Jesus and he believed. And here's what I think is true. I believe that you can encounter that same Jesus today. All of us can, no matter what your questions are, no matter what your doubts are, no matter uh, the concerns that you have. I hope you know this, they aren't too big for God. He, he can handle all of those things. He showed up for Thomas in his doubt, and he will show up for you in your doubt. Just ask him. But let me ask you and all of us this question. Is what doubt have you allowed to keep you at a distance to Jesus? I mean, here's the, the, the part of my heart is I have seen so many people in my life as a pastor who have just a single doubt and has led them so far away from Christ. Just one thing that you allow to keep you at a distance to Jesus, which has never been the thing that God has wanted. A doubt that God has not desired to keep you from him or to hang around him, but maybe actually to propel you in your faith. And so I would encourage you and challenge you to identify that and seek answers, seek discovery for 
your doubts. One thing that I've learned over the years is working with high school students is that there's a plethora of information out there to help you believe anything uh, about anything. How many know that's true, right? You hop on the internet, you could find a source for what you want to believe. You could find a YouTube thing, you could find an article, you could find anything out there to help you believe what you want to believe. In fact, I was doing a little bit of research about this this week to help me uh, wrap my mind around this, and I found out I found out that even Abraham Lincoln knew that this was true all the way back then. He said this. He said, don't believe everything you read on the internet just because there's a picture with a quote next to it. (laughs) Even he knew this, right? (laughs) You've got to be careful, honestly, where you find your information and what you recognize as truth. But with any bit of time, you can find uh, sources or things or links to believe about almost anything. You've gotta be careful with your research, but the truth is there. The truth is out there. And one thing I learned several years ago, maybe you remember this, is this mantra, don't doubt with doubters. If you have doubts, don't, don't spend your time expressing those people uh, to people who will fuel your doubts. Spend your time exploring your doubts with people who can help you find answers. So don't let your doubt keep you from God and his people. Thomas, all I'm trying to say is Thomas stuck around in his doubt until he came of a pla- uh, into a place of faith, and you can as well. So let me wrap this up. Uh, we, we've seen some different responses to Jesus in, in these chapters. We've seen the soldiers' resistance. We've seen Pilate's indifference. We've seen Mary's life-changing excitement and Thomas's doubt. What do we learn from this? No. What I learned from this is that there's a lot of responses to Jesus. You, you already know this. We, we know this in our world, right? Um, people have different responses to Jesus. In fact, when Jesus lived, he knew this as well. At one point, he turned to his disciples and looked at them, and he says, he says who do you say that I am? Right? Who, who do you say? What is your response to me? And in that moment, Peter stepped up, and he says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. For all the things that Peter got wrong, like cutting people's ears off. He got that one right. He got this moment right. And today, I think you need to recognize something because there's a lot of opinions and responses to Jesus in this world. But today, what really matters is your response. Your response. The life and death and the resurrection of Jesus demand a response from you. It does. What will it be? I beg you not to be indifferent, not to be resistant. We, we live in a world, listen, we live in a world that's got way too many people like that. Way too many people that, that see Jesus as just an add-on to life or, or even worse than that, that he's not really worth considering giving any significant thought to. What's your response? What is your response to Jesus? Because there is an empty grave that has no body in it. Amen? There is an empty grave that has no body in it. And listen, he told us ahead of time what he was going to do, and then he did it. What are you going to do with that? What is going to be your response today? My prayer for us as we walk through this story and this narrative is that there would be somebody in here who would make a decision. There would be somebody who would make a decision for Christ for the very first time. In fact, in just a few moments, we're going to celebrate a couple baptisms of people who are making that decision. And we will celebrate with them. Maybe that's one of you in here today. That you've been indifferent, that you've you've been uh, resistant to Jesus, but maybe today is the day that you need to respond to his truth. Maybe there's somebody in here that needs to make a decision to seek answers to your doubt that's been holding holding you up. Or maybe it's a decision to go from indifference to engagement in your faith and at your church. If you're the type of person who wants like a lot more practical things than that, if you open up the Bible app, I've put some application in there that you can find. The bottom line is is that we're all called to make a decision about Jesus. Your response to Jesus is the single most important decision that you will ever make in your life. It has the power to shape your life now and for eternity. And so I would challenge you and encourage you not to take it lightly. Let's pray together. Lord, we are so thankful for who you are and what you've done for us. Thank you for Jesus and his life and his death and his resurrection that bring us a hope out of this world to spend an eternity 
with you. Lord, we are so thankful for that. And as we walk through this story today, Lord, we are reminded of just how much you love us, how much you were in control of everything and how you still decided to lay your life down for us. I pray for some of us in this room, Lord. I pray for a couple things. I pray for some people for the first time, whatever it looks like, to, to, to choose Jesus. Whether it's young or old, some of us have, have never really responded in the way that we are demanded to respond to the life, death, and resurrection of your son. And so I pray that you would move our hearts to the next step in that today. But Lord, I pray for many in this room who need to, to move to a new place, to, to need to move to a place that responds to you, not out of um, complacency, but out of excitement, Lord for who you are and what you have accomplished. Lord, we worship you in this moment because of Jesus in the empty grave. We love you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand to our feet as we respond to the word this morning. If you're a prayer counselor in the room, we want to invite you forward. We're going to have prayer counselors along the front. Whatever decision you're making this morning, there are people up here who want to pray with you and stand with you. So let's respond to the word.
shout. There's no body in the grave. And that same power that raised Christ lives in you. Come on. That is so good. Oh, I love celebrating the Lord, but I also love celebrating new life. And there's new life happening this morning. We've got baptisms to celebrate. So turn your attention back to the baptistry. My name is Jessica, and this is my daughter, Audrey. She comes today to make a profession of faith and to be baptized. So Audrey, will you repeat this confession of faith after me? Yes. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the living God. The Son of the living God. And I confess Him as my Lord and Savior. And I confess Him as my Lord and Savior. Because of this confession, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, hello, my name is Jennifer, and this is my friend Kate. She has come today to profess her faith in Jesus Christ. So, Kate, will you repeat after me? I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. Son of the Living God. And I confess him, I confess him as my Lord and Savior. As my Lord and Savior. <laughs> I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is Brooks, my new friend from um, Bible Club. We're so glad that he is here today to profess his faith in Jesus Christ. So Brooks, will you repeat after me? Yes. I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. The Son of the Living God. And I confess him. And I confess him as my Lord and Savior. As my Lord and Savior. I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Janine, and she has come to recommit her life to the Lord. Those were her two children that just went. And now, as mom, she's going to set that example. So, repeat after me. I believe. I believe. That Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. The Son of the Living God. And I confess Him. And I confess Him. As my Lord and Savior. As my Lord and Savior. Okay. Upon confession of this this great confession that you made, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What an awesome morning. Well, we're so glad that all of you chose to join us today. If you are a guest, Stop by Guest Connections out in the lobby. We would love to meet you before you leave. But have an awesome week. We will see you back next weekend.